Welcome everybody, we're back on the roof. I've been waiting to do this for so long and I finally got in touch with our guest and we were finally able to arrange a good time to be able to get this and now we can sit down and really just kind of rip. One of my favorite artists known as Psychedelic Pete, Pete Nogus. Welcome Pete. Hey, how's it going Scott? Uh, glad to be a part of this and uh, welcome to the Psychedelic Casa. <laughs> Psychedelic <laughs> Casa, okay. Listen, I love your work. I love your style. I think I have so a high, even a higher regard for you and your work based on your intent and where you're coming from. Can you talk a little bit about why and how music became such an uh, important part of your work? Well, music is um, just, I would go in my room when I was a kid, you know, put on, you know, an album. It, back then we had radio, but then as the albums got going, um, and I would just like draw things, you know, I, uh, as, as maybe we talked earlier this week and stuff, kind of social butterflies. So when I would draw, I just drew what I felt, go to school the next morning and basically we give out pieces and music, um, would just help me escape. So as a child, I would just listen to it, pick up on certain things. And then as I saw what album art was doing to help promo these musicians, it just wrapped me in, and, and then I just went into a whole new genre where I was just listening to live albums at my friend's basement, you know, just hanging out, and that's all we did. We just hang out and just listen to stuff, and mostly listen to, like, my friend Dave Madigan's older brother, who was, like, you know, five years older, and just listen to this just great stuff and, and art and seeing just the things that were hidden on album covers. It just blew me away, yeah. so, you know, and, and I think yeah. that's... You know, it, it's it's tough now because talking to my 18 year old grandson, it's different when you went to, you know, Caldors or all these old stores back in the days and you picked up an album. You know, you already knew that you heard five or six songs that were pretty popular on the radio. And maybe on that uh, on those tracks, they had 12. So you, you already knew that was a big seller. But just to see the artwork and just, yeah. you know, everything that, that was involved with, with that. And they just coincide with each other. It was a totally different experience, music, uh, back in those days when there was almost like a romance between like going to... Yorma just did this. He, he just came out with a vinyl thing now. That he just recorded with uh, this guy, John Hurl, but that's it's a great piece. But they're releasing it in record stores, in vinyl, and that's like a big deal. But like, remember what it was like to go in and just search to record stores and kind of flip through all the... You know, whether you whether you went in with an intention for a specific record or not, you would find things regardless. And it was always just a calming, meditative experience almost, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's times where I've purchased albums just because of the album art. You know what I mean? Without, that, like without a doubt. And then when you really listen to some of the deep stuff, then you hear some of it, you know, down the road, many years down with other musicians who were listening to probably that same album. Were there any particular artists that you, you kind of resonated with you when you were exploring artwork through albums back in those days? Well, I mean, you, you got the greats like Stanley Mouse. Uh, uh, I, I could go on. I mean, a lot of people used uh, Alphonse Mucha, who's my favorite artist. He's uh, Art Nouveau period, Renaissance, um, the late 1800s or so. And, and, and he also did a lot of poster art. So, um, yeah, it's it's kind of hard to describe because uh, you have yes album covers, you have um, like Molly Hatchet, Frank Frazetta. You're right. I mean, You're he, right. He, he he really I I want to intricate say out of most albums, he really took it from a, he took a sci-fi perspective, but this barbaric thing, and then you got this great band of Molly Hatchet coming out of. Florida, when Southern Rock was like really, really getting huge, so it's yep. like you really yep. had to do it. But then you take this incredible artwork 
And you just have to like say, I got to check it out, you know, and they kept that theme. And there's questions. Did Frank Francetti build Molly Hatchet or did Molly Hatchet, you know, <laughs> you know, establish himself, which I think they did. But I mean, it just goes to show you the power of artistry and album where, you know, you get blown away, you know, automatically you see Frank Franzetti's stuff and you're saying, oh, I've seen that on Molly Hatchet's album. You know, it's, yeah. it's cool. Yeah. And and also then the psychedelic uh, music from like the Hate ashbury and the, and the Southern Rock as well was one style. And then it was the progressive rock from overseas too. Like the, I, Roger Dean was one of my favorite oh, artists because of what he did just, not just with Yes though, like Uriah Heep and, and, and other stuff too, Asia. He did, you know, a lot of work that was, again, really designed for the particular acts he was doing it for. And it was, I, the more I would read about how these things evolved, the more interesting it became. Well, it, 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 it gets really, really cool. Like when I, when I've done a couple of these albums, the musicians, as they're cutting their tracks down, will send me some of their songs that they're a little bit more partial at that time period, which then I have to try to take that in to perspective and try to see where they want to go with this, you know, develop I mean, you a know, concept like, yeah, you, you have to develop it, you know, like, like with Nanda Blues out in Italy, uh, Max described that this photograph that his girlfriend took of this beautiful um, black woman who had some voodoo mystical. And then he gave me this whole story about how one of his friends was in love with this girl that, um, Nanda Blues was taken care of and kind of ran like this bordella. And it was kind of trippy how this whole thing went about. But like he fell in love with her and wanted to talk to this woman. And everybody was scared of Nanda Blues because she had this mystical um, black magic thing going on. So when I did the album cover, I had to incorporate that picture, but then give it a psychedelic feel, but also mystical. And, and to deal with somebody overseas, not, you know, knowing much about their music. I mean, they're very Southern uh, rock influence, but great musicians, three-piece band. And, and it was just cool, you know? The piece that you did for Buddy Guy, it's an intricate, it's a, it's a, a complex story, but can you tell that story? Oh, I definitely can. Um, so many moons back, uh, jumping backwards, we went to this uh, big festival in Connecticut. Well, it was around, but mostly it was in Connecticut. It was called Gathering the Vibes. And, uh, Buddy Guy happened to be on the ticket, played on a Sunday. It was just blown away. That was the first time we got to see him. And his his presence on stage was just amazing, you know. And my wife next to me, she kind of she kind of lost it, like watching Bead Bills. And it was very powerful. So needless to say, fast forward in a couple months later, Buddy Guy's doing the Jimi Hendrix Experience Tour. And we're in Waterbury Palace. And we basically are on this little landing. And I see Rick um, Paul, but he's rhythm slash lead guitarist with him. And I just yell out his name and say, hey, man, uh, we saw you guys a couple months back. And I just want to say um, it was awesome. I did a piece with Buddy Guy, um, an earlier piece, and I was hoping to get back to him. And Rick decided to say, hey, man, you won't get to meet Buddy, but I'd be happy to take that piece. So those couple years down the road, we developed a nice little friendship. Rick, Marty, um, I got to meet Tim and Orlando. So we get to see Buddy Guy about four years later, and I had a mishap with a piece that I was going to give Buddy Guy. It broke on me. So I had to develop the piece that you're talking about, which uh, was a uh, Woodburn timeline of Buddy Guy, uh, two foot by four foot, all sepia tone, no color in it. Starts off from Letsworth, Louisiana. And branches out to Chicago, where Legends is club is. It had all of his awards and everything. And then um, a friend of mine, we plasma cut two uh, guitar necks, strat shaped, and patinaed them. We show up at the show that night, and I have my wife, my grandson, uh, Nicholas, with us. And basically, as they saw this piece, Rick goes, goes, well, do you want to meet Buddy Guy? And I said, I'd love to meet him. Well. Sure enough, um, Marty uh, takes asks me, he goes, can I take a picture of this magnificent piece? He goes, many people have given Buddy Guy a lot of stuff. But this is unbelievable. And I said, sure. He takes a picture, and then we got called into the dressing room. 
and there's Buddy Guy sitting there, and um, my wife is with me, and uh, my grandson. So we're given like talk five minutes. Buddy's busy. Explain the piece and and then move on. I said, okay, no problem. So I see him. I say, hello, buddy. Um, I did this nice little wood burning of you, which is, you know, uh, uh, a timeline of your accomplishments through the years. And um, basically I told him, I says, I was making um, restitution with a piece that happened a few years ago broke. And I told him I was going to do this big, big piece. Well, buddy's touched by it. We leave the room. And Rick's trying to find us some tickets. Five minutes later, the manager from Buddy Guy comes back out of the bus, the dressing room and goes, hey, man, he goes, Buddy wants to know if you signed this piece. And I was like, yeah, I would burn the piece. And he goes, no, well, he wants you to come back in here. He goes, your wife can come back here and your grandson can come back here. So at that time, my, my head's filled with the air. I'm on cloud nine. You know? I don't know what to say. And we walk back into the room. And... Buddy guy says, I don't know when's the last time I've asked for someone's autograph. Could you sign this piece for me? And my wife took some really nice pictures of it, but here I am there. His, his bodyguard is holding up the piece against the wall. And buddy guys over my shoulder, hands me a Sharpie. And I says, where would you like me to sign this buddy? And he goes right over Letsworth, Louisiana, which just blew my mind because when I do this stuff, it's a very spiritual feeling. And all this started for Buddy at Let's Worth the Dance, and then it just branched out. And uh, sure enough, he loved it. And, and he did say, which it may happen, may not, I don't know, but he said, he goes, when it comes time, this piece may go into the National Museum of the Blues. And I thought that was, to me, it was just an honor yeah. to connect with somebody that we're, we're, we're different genres, we're different generations. But just to connect and to see that picture of him overlook my shoulder, like I explained to you earlier last week, Scott, was the fact that it's no different than having a, a, a writer or a famous musician sign a CD, a book, you know, a piece of art, you know, and I was living that moment and it, it, it was surreal, you know, it was it was yeah. beautiful because it's, it's a connection aspect. You know what? His his body of work stands with the best, the very best, clearly. No doubt about it. It's nothing, you know what I mean? And, and hopefully we'll get to be up, when this pandemic goes, I'd like to get up to Chicago and go to Legends. You know, yeah. Just, you know. That'd be cool, yeah. Now, the other one, the other story is a, a guy who we both hold a reverence for, Dwayne Allman. Can you tell that story? Yeah, the Dwayne Allman piece, uh, well, it basically was... Uh, I just got done finishing up uh, a project or commission work for some uh, company out in East Hartford, Connecticut. And um, find a, I find I felt like I got schmoozed on the deal. You know, me and my buddy, you know, I, um, you know, karma, karma comes back. But needless to say, I had to get away from doing some projects that I was doing. And I just had to try to try to come to peace with myself. And so I started working on this um, painting of Dwayne Allman. And uh, it's 22 by 30. Um, and I created it in about four days. So a lot of, a lot of my fans are in the Allman Brothers, Southern Rock, Gen, you know, era, a lot of Grateful Dead, Jimi Hendrix, but Allman Brothers right now, really, really big. So I got a lot of followers. So I finished this piece. And a good friend of mine, um, Adam, up in upstate New York, goes up to me and says, hey, man, do you mind if I share this picture with somebody? I think she's really going to love this. So I said, sure, go ahead, man. Well, the person that he ended up sharing with was Gladriella Allman. And I get a message from her. And she says, wow, this is really beautiful. I really love this. And I go, yeah, a lot of people like it. And I said to her, I said, if you want it, you can have it. The only thing is I won't frame it, but I'll, if you just give me your address or a place I can ship it to, I'll just ship it to you. But I said, yeah, I'm sure you got lots of photos and a lot of great artwork from your father, but I'd be willing to do that. Well, she didn't get back to me until a little bit later, and it happened to be the 45th anniversary of the Alm Brothers. And they were on tour, and we I want to say we saw them earlier in the springtime, 
but they were coming to Mountain Jam, a uh, big, big uh, Warren Haynes festival. And I happened to be off that Sunday, so me and Connie would drive up to Hunter Mountain, New York, and basically check out the festival just for Sunday. Well, it was unknown to me that Gladriella had been writing a, uh, a book about her father that she had released that year uh, called Please Be With Me. And it was just different interviews with with uh, people who have played with Dwayne and, and, and a lot of insight. Well, we get to Mountain Jam and we're sitting there and she's doing a nice little passage reading of what's going on in the book. And after she's done, I kind of introduced myself and I brought the piece with me. And she asked, asked me, she goes, I got to go do some signings, but could you just hold on and I'll be right with you? I said, sure, no problem. We understand your work. Well, we wait in line. And it comes time where I'm getting ready to meet her. And John Lazinski, who was an editor, I believe, uh, hit the note, comes up and says, hey, man, do you need a book signed? And I said, no, I don't. I, we have an arrangement. And Gladriella comes up to me and says, basically, um, she says, you got to see this painting. And John goes, what are you talking about? He goes, we open it up. And he goes, yeah, man, I seen this painting, you know. And I go, uh, yeah, this this is the painting of uh, Hit the Note, Dwayne Allman. And she goes, you sure you don't want any prints of this? You don't want this? I said, no. Nah. I said, a signed copy of your book means the world to me. It's an easy, yeah. even swap. And I felt that what better is to have a piece of art both to Dwayne's only child. You know what I mean? To me, that was just an honor. And so, you know, we packed up. And then I showed her another piece, um, which actually is in the, it's called Soflo. It's of Dwayne Allman, a little wood burning, but it's in the big house museum. And, you know, just, just putting it out there, like the song Gilded Splinters and stuff, it's about putting sparks of energy. When, when, when you're out there trying to get your guest and, and me trying to meet somebody, it's just like, you're just going to go for it. You know what I mean? And, and, and you're going to come across stumbling paths and different routes and whatever, but you know you're going to try to say, hey, how did you get to meet Buddy Guy? I just felt I was going to do it. Yeah. And you know what? Yeah. How did you get to meet Glad Guy? It just yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to be positive. You know? I mean, you put it out there like we discussed earlier. It comes back. <laughs> it may take a little time, but it's going to come back. Just like if you put negative stuff out there, it's yep. going to come back to it. So true, yep. You know? So I'm very proud of that. I mean, I'm, I'm honored. You know, to have met um, these musicians or family members, you know, what I mean, it's nice when you see Kurt West, who does a lot of photography for the yeah, own brothers. Yeah, and he's yeah, yeah. Photography both things too. And we've had talks and he just says, man, he goes, you yeah. got it. And, and, and to me, that it's good because I feel like I should have been back in that era when things were starting, you know. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know if I'll agree with that because of where you are right now. Like you're in a great place and, and your journey, you know, it's a different journey, man. You know, it's not just, you know, rock and roll and art There's so much more to your story. And I think that um, it all contributes to putting you exactly where you are right now. Do you agree with yeah, that? I, oh, I, I totally agree with that. I, I, I've been able to give, I, I look at it this way. You, what you put out there, you may get, Maybe you get 25% of it. Maybe you get 10. Maybe you get 75% of it. But there's always going to be things that you put out there that you sit there and go, well, I probably shouldn't have done that. But that happens. I'm a little yeah. different than anybody else. But yeah. right now I'm in a great place because I'm going to be 55. We're out here in uh, Florida where we call, obviously we call our, our business the Psychedelic Casa. And it's nice when I can be able to try to get as much art as I can, whether it's like you've probably seen these Christmas ornaments. Oh there. man, we'll get to that too. You know, up to commission, commission work, which is big paintings. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it, it's a, it's a great journey, you know, I mean, and, uh, and it just can get handed to you. just like you don't get, you don't become the best baseball player. You don't become the best basketball player, football player, musician. It's work, but it's the, it's what you decide that you're going to do. And when you have like my soulmate, my wife 
is is my biggest critique. She's got to listen to all my ideas, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, probably that's why the psycho comes crazy because of being a Marine and being just constantly thinking. And, you know, I, if I could paint for everybody and get them something, it'd be cool. You know what I mean? Just because it, it's, it, it's just nice to see people escape from what's going on in reality. You know what I mean? And it doesn't have to be a drug illusion painting you know what i mean it's i try to paint the soul i try to capture as much soulful um colors you know what i mean i'm not going to be the rembrandt but i'm going to be the person who's going to say man I, I i can feel you in this yeah and i can feel what i'm painting you know yeah no nah, and you you do do that you capture that totally there's a lot of feeling a lot of soul that's undeniable i mean it doesn't just it, you don't have to stare at it and figure it out. It it jumps out. It's it's clear as day. I mean, your work is. I love your work, man. I love it. Thank you. I think I think that comes from your spirit. Spiritual has it just um, it's it's a vow through the years, and 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 how do I mean by that? It's it's like taking that blank canvas and just basically um, drawing your sketch, erasing your sketch putting a different sketch on, coming up with more paint and stuff. So when spiritual things happen, like the buddy guy aspect, that was spiritual, you know, um, giving to donations for worthy causes. And, you know, and someone come back and say, hey, man, thanks for that donation. We just raised $300 for Haiti relief. You know what I mean? And I'm like, awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and some people will sit there and go, dude, you put, you know, and the only reason I bring up, the buddy guy because i heard a lot of slack on that was dude you put over 80 hours in this piece and you just gave it away yeah where uh, this person could afford what you just did and i say it, this is who i am yes. you know what i mean he moved yep. me you know what i'm saying and you know what i got this good vibe about him which is a spiritual vibe and i and to know that the extent where that piece went it could be nothing but to me spiritual just just all these little tributaries just started branching off you know what i mean and a lot of guys will go up to me and say what we like is you're doing stuff handmade pretty much you know what i mean uh, you know we're talking on the phone right now i'm not too computer illiterate and a good friend of mine who's a talented artist steve johansson he's telling me you got to make these moves you could make so many things quicker for you you know, that are yeah, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in the same aspect, I, I I love when he critiques me. You know, he shares a lot of stuff with me, so it's awesome. But in the same aspect, it's like, I like the feeling of being all that hands-on. You know what I mean? Instead yeah, of doing just yeah. A few, you know, and, and sometimes it's, ch it's chance and sometimes it's error. But you know what? I've come to a point now, like a musician, they may know that off-key that they hit. The band members may know, but they play through it. Of course, and, and yeah. Like, you know, and now I do that with my stuff. I've learned to correct the mistake and not let it eat me up. Just, just go with the flow. Didn't you always like listen? Like I personally, when when a a band would come out with a live album, I used to just love just hearing a song done live, just because there was some nuance there that wasn't in the standard recording that the radio station would play every single time. You hear it so repetitively. It's just, a, it's live. It's a little different. I mean, oh, it, some little it's, nuance. Oh, and, and it's tough for me because when I go to a festival or live music or anything with a lot of color, should I say, a lot yeah. of things going on, man, my brain is just like, you know, I don't need to do drugs. You know what I mean? It's like, Yeah, right. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, you're just in this whole area. And I, <laughs> you can't help the situation. But what's cool about live music, what you're saying, is I like it when you see the musicians feeding off themselves. Oh, my God. Yeah. And when they're lost, you're seeing something special. You yes. Know I mean, when, you know, because they're not even thinking about the 3,000 to 10,000 or even 15 people out there yeah they're just they're, when they're locked yeah it's the best in the world you know there's that's so true like that's the thing about going to live events like that i and a friend of mine that we used to go see the outlaws all the time the outlaws awesome. played in in brooklyn in this place in bushwick in this bar 
we're going like, you know, we grew up like blocks from this place. So it's like, it's going back. And, and, and me and this guy happened to go to a lot of shows together too over the years. And um, we go to this like bar, like Bushwick has completely been like um, gentrified completely. It's a whole different experience now, right? But we get there, there were literally eight people in the place, including us. There was like six other people besides us. And and he, they came out and they played like an entire set. They, they even came out them going, uh, Henry Paul goes like, you know, I don't even, I don't know if we've ever experienced this. But those are like the most intimate shows. You know? Dude, it was so unbelievable to be one of them eight. I mean, I can't tell you, like, that was a memory. You know, and then recently was another uh, of Scott Sherrod just did this thing. Robert Randolph, Vernon Reed, Lisa Fisher, Dwayne Betts. Like this was one of those nights that I would put up there with. I've seen some great shows over the years. This was one of those nights that you're talking about where they're each pushing each other to a to another level of just raw yeah, it's, beauty. It's just that, it's it's just level after level. I mean, you see that you it's almost like I guess you could say like. Grateful Dead and Allman Brothers and a lot of those old, the old style bands that it wasn't about paying playing for two hours and then you're done. You know what I mean? It was like <laughs> they played for four or five yeah. hours. Yeah. They just, they just, they're giving it their love and, and, to, yes. and to know people experience that that's that's amazing. Yeah, you know. Yep. I mean, it, it brings me up a story like what you just said. A kid who worked with me when I was in the liquor business, he was in a lot of heavy punk rock, you know, this stuff. He goes, he saw Nirvana with 12 people in New Haven. Five months later, bam, they hit. So like when I talk to some of these bands, you know, yeah. and, I, and get, right, I don't play music, but I'm a very positive person. And I'll sit yeah. here and I'll talk to my buddies, like, like, like Otis. I said, what's to say you can't be that next government mule for guys yeah not playing like one but saying what's to say you can't be i said to me what words i've always lived by and, and i preach this dream the world evolves dream big it. man because you know what everybody tells you the story that they dreamed i may not be the best artist out there or may not be the well nothing else but you know what i've never stopped i, I you know i worked yeah. raised my family been a great grandparent. You know, it, it that that's the big thing though. There's that vibe. There's um I remember going to see Hot Tuna one night coming out after the show, the sun was coming up. I mean, you know, you you, you don't forget something like that. It's impossible. You know, when we've been at Gathered Vibes, we've had um a couple of band members come in, you know, hang out, party, and it was just kind of cool. And and now like say I'm not part, you know, like my good friend Rick. He'll, if, if Buddy Guy's in town and he's playing, him or Mario will message me and say, hey, what are you guys up to? Yeah, yeah. And That's cool. I mean, you know, I, I was thinking, too, when you were saying about, you know, I don't need to get high. I remember, like, I, I interview a lot of these girls. They're, like, they're, they're healers or whatever. And, and there's a lot of different methods that the people do to kind of work with other people and kind of get past traumas. And one of them is microdosing and ayahuasca, like plant-based medicines. Oh, yeah. I tripped. With a design to get high, not with a design to have any kind of spiritual awakening. I got, I got some funky shit happened because I was high, you know, you experience it different, you know. But it was never like, you know, being, I went to see more colors when Pink Floyd was playing. You know what I mean? I went to see, you know, different different bands that, that you know, um, they would have, you know, uh, video shows going on behind. The, 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 the brothers used to always have that that light show and stuff. And, oh, and yeah. in the progressive rock too, they had, it just enhanced the experience. So there was always a little mescaline, whatever you got your hands on. It was always to, to enhance that. Right. Now it's a whole not, Now I go to these shows completely sober and I enjoy it on another level so much more. It's not like I, I didn't need that. Or my, it is what it is. It was what it was. It's just that right now, the perspective and the appreciation for the whole ensemble of an event what what comes with the artwork that goes into creating a whole experience not just it's not just music it's well, so that, much that, more than that yeah and that's that's what we love about live music uh, you know we we went from the festivals aspect and then uh, a couple of years back we decided to go on jam cruise which was totally cool it's just you know and, and we did it um 
my wife was turning 50 and I was turning 50 the following year. So I decided a good friend of ours said, man, you got to do this. And yeah. we're like, okay, well, let's, let's give it a shot. So we, we said, instead of throwing a big 50th birthday party, let's save up money and go on this jam cruise. Just yeah. Yeah. So it was right. And, and gathering the vibes did 20 year run. And that was it. You know, it was good because we got to see Greg Allman. We got to see Tedeschi trucks. Yeah. Um, born to Governor Mule. It was a great, great, great way to end that, that festival. And 20 years is a long run of festival. So yeah. now we're on jam cruise and we're getting exposed to this whole thing. And what was cool about it, jam cruise got a lot of tech rock, you know, you got a lot of blues, you got a lot of you know, bluegrass, you got everything going on, you know, yeah. DJs. But what was cool about it, they had theme nights. So one night was yellow night. One night was Dr. <laughs> Seuss night. You know what I'm saying? And here you are going on this cruise and people come. There was one sesame. They called it yellow night, Scott. This dude had Big Bird and was taller than me. It was like the actual Big Bird. And I'm thinking, how the fuck did you get this on the boat? But now you, like what you said, you know, I like my couple of beers. Maybe I might smoke, you know, a little grass. But that's about it. I, that, that's, that's. Yeah. It's the vibe of just watching other people. It's vibe of watching, like saying, "Oh, geez, I don't think I ever did that." But man, look at that guy over there. And then you see these yeah. these girls in hula hoop, you know what I mean, and doing their thing. And then seeing different ages where music just unites everybody. And you could be 13 years old, yeah. or you could be 75. Look at the Dead, for example. What a Dead concert was. Like especially the outdoor shows, like back in the day, and it's still going strong on it with a whole nother generation. Probably this is two generations later, and it's still having a, a profound effect. Yeah, you know, and you get a lot of diehard um, Grateful Dead fans and stuff that say, "Well, you know, they're just continuing to beat this drum." You know what I mean? And trying yeah. to get everything out well, of. There's still sixty thousand people there, you know. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm looking at saying, "Well, if if." If you're the Brett Favre and everybody says, retire, retire, and all you've known how to do most of your life is play football, it's tough to step down from that pedestal. And when you see like great groups like the Grateful Dead and Bob Weir and you know even Phil Lesh doing his own thing, and you just see these guys doing it, and then now you take in a guy, a, another great talented musician, John Mayer, and put him into this, this genre, and now he just takes in all these bubblegum lot you know, rock kids and stuff like this and video and whatever, or should I say from the radio station, the, the, should I say the corporate radio stations? Now you got this guy and he's just building out and it's like he just, just gelled together. You know I mean? He just gelled with it and they're rolling and yeah, these guys are rich as hell. So yeah, money's good, but you know, it's about having a good time. Yeah. And now in, yeah. These, time, and these, in these time, James, like when I go to a show, I don't care where my money goes to or political or charitable raise, whatever. I want to go. I want to enjoy the crowd. I want the music to come. I want to escape reality for two to three hours of just listening to music because all that shit's going to be back. Once you go back through those gates and get in your car, you have that great time, but you just got to escape. And music is. Yeah. The is greatest. The, like, it, the Allman brothers, even more so like they represented so much. Uh, blues, jamming, and everything, but blues. They were a, a blues, strong blues influence, right? What is it about blues to you? What what grabs you, and what what resonates with you about blues? The blues music, I think, just it's it's a deep, soul touching sound that everybody resonates with, sometime in their life, and 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 when you can listen to it, I think it gets you over that hump. It passes on, you know what I mean? When you realize that, geez, if they're singing about somebody who just lost his girlfriend or drug yeah. or alcohol abuse or whatever, yeah. it's about getting over that milestone, you know what I mean? And, and and it's sad that the blues is taking so long to get embraced, but it wasn't embraced until, obviously, like we all know, it got embraced more over in England than it did in the United States where it started, you know? And, and, and... You, you hear the blues. It, it's in every. It's in everything. It, every famous musician has got that upbringing, just like every soul does. You know, we all have trials and tribulations in life. So yeah. we 
we have our own blues, you know? Yeah. You mentioned something earlier too that I, I just want to make sure that I ask you about music being healing. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. That is that is the ultimate gift that music is in so many ways. Even when we don't, when our intention is not to heal from anything like that, it's just, it's so soothing. And, and but particularly when something's going on, when some people are going through stuff, it, even if it's just, okay, you're going to listen to a specific song and it's going to take you away from whatever it is that's fucking with you for three minutes. It's just going to let you sail. You know, even though you come back to it or whatever, whatever the, you know, sometimes it actually impacts us in a much more, poignant way but sometimes it's just a relief it just allows us to sell could you talk about your you know can you tell me what you feel about the healing power of music well when, when i'm listening to music like say if i'm listening to music while i'm painting which i usually always have music going on it it um sometimes when i'm just listening to the the beats or that are going on it may develop a a certain stroke when I'm painting or a certain um, detailed area or sometimes because when I do a lot of painting, I have the laid out of what I'm going to go with, but then I improvise with everything that I'm doing as it's progressing. Right. Which is like, it's kind of like painting without a net a little bit. So when you're listening to music and a certain song hits you or a certain lyric that you may pick up sometimes when you stare at a piece you may be able to pick that up out of the piece and then i bring it out and it could be just because of that particular song that's playing so the spirit of of what's being played sometimes too shows up a lot in in my pieces like it's 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 real difficult when you see all these famous photographers taking these famous pictures of these musicians yeah and then when you get asked, can you put your spin on it? A lot of times I got to listen to, say, like, say, Warren Haynes or Dwayne Allman, you know, what they're going. And I got to have that song going on. And then it's like it's bouncing back off the, the, the painting aspect. It's like the music is going into the paper, bouncing off into my head. And then I'm going to take it to the next uh, level yeah. where that's going to go. It's like it's kind of like I'm grabbing the beat out of the air subconsciously and then applying it, you know, and like when you see like like I say, like Dwayne, when he's hitting slide. Well, why do why do I put Dwayne with so much color? Well, it was a tragic loss. You know what I mean? And 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 here this this gentleman has done so much, just like so many other musicians who who passed on between uh, such an early age. But it's like. They saw the light. And they went with it. And, yeah. and and I think it's, they felt the spirit of that. I'm going to be a guitar player. I'm going to hit the drums. I'm going to paint. I'm going to write. I'm going to direct. And when you feel that, you try to, in, in a spiritual sense of painting, you try to bring it out. You try to, you try to escape what's existing, you know, the stress that you have and creating a different type of stress by emulating the feeling of the music, the musician, the photograph, and what it's going to relate to the person who is purchasing or, or commissioning me to do this. So um, there's many times in, 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 in painting something that can be very stressful. Um, like I explained to you earlier last week that you can be stressed painting something because you're, you're putting your mark on it but there's so many other variables that are going in. You, you're dealing with could be 30,000 fans, could be 5,000 fans, or it could be just the one person of you painting their pet or their father or mother. You got to, you have to sell that to them and you're not there to sell it to everybody. You know what I mean? You're going to have the person who's happy with it say, Oh, we love it. But the other sibling could come in there and say, ah, it doesn't look like him. It doesn't look like that. You know? And, So when I paint spiritually, or should I say, when I paint, there's times where I I can't go back to the canvas because I decompress. Sometimes I get migraines because you get so wrapped up. And when you, and when you're listening to music in the background and, 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 and you're picking up on certain things that the musicians who perform that knew it was there or they, 
they put it in there, you know what I mean? Like a chirp sound, like from Dwayne just hitting a chirp. And, and now you're putting your twist on, um, uh, spiritually and emotionally, it can take a lot out of you. And, um, one of the, one of the coolest things that happened just recently was, um, Dwayne's birthday just had passed. So I posted a lot of pictures of yeah. Dwayne on pieces I did. And this one gentleman messaged me and says, Hey man, do you mind if I share this? This is really awesome stuff, but I understand if you don't want me to share it on his, on his Facebook page. I says, yeah, man, go ahead and share it. Because I look at it this way, arts to be shared, music's to be shared. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, you pay for it here and there, but you know what? If I inspire someone else to pick up a paintbrush, that's awesome. You know what I mean? That's worth more than money. So this gentleman, getting back to him, I said, sure, go ahead and share it. And he goes, man, he goes, I played with Dwayne at Muscle Shoals. And he goes, he would have dug your art. Now, I obviously I researched, you know, who he was and found out, yeah, he, he played at Muscle Shoals. Yeah, he's an old gentleman. He would be around the time um 76 77 years old but to me that's like that's a cool uh, another outstanding compliment just because the fact that this gentleman hung yeah. out with Dwayne or so yeah. you know so there's there's it, it's hard for me to explain the spirituality of what I do because um sometimes I like to revisit a piece four years ago or walk into someone's house if, if I did something for you Scott and when you paint sometimes, and I know a lot of artists will say this, sometimes you get sick of what you're doing and you just can't wait it to be done. Yeah. And when it's done, and you know, like when you, when things are time sensitive, it's easier because you don't critique yourself. But when a, you revisit that piece and say, I walk into your house and I see that piece three years ago, I'm like, damn, I can't believe I did this. Because sometimes maybe I was in a different trance. You right. know what I mean? And you, because you're just doing stuff. I, it's hard. It's hard. I, I'm, Aside from your artwork as, as an artist, right? Could you, is there an experience that you would, that would come to mind that you could share of just you as an individual when you were going through something, right? And a particular song just lifted you. Oh, there's, there's a, um, I, I, many years back, I, I brainstorm a lot, just, it happens a lot. And um, so I would say about 10, 15 years ago, my wife told me, get a book, write it down. Because a lot of my ideas will come off a song. And um, one, one incident at, at, to, to, to really uh, tie this up, um, GABA Fest, a big thing down in, in Macon, Georgia, I'm, I'm a member of, I, and I donate a lot of artwork to the foundation because it's to me, it's a good cause. There's a lot of things. They, they help a lot of musicians get their startup. They help a lot of people in the community. It's a really cool thing. Well, when Butch trucks took his life, um, I felt that was going to be my donation piece for GABA fest. So I did a 18 by 24 wood burning of Butch trucks, a famous picture Sidney Smith took, um, where Butch is like smoking a cigarette and he's kind of, kind of facing the crowd. It's a black and white photo, but I, I had to put color in it. So, so I start wood burning the layout and I'm listening to a lot of Alm Brothers music at the time. And in, in all four corners, I put all four peaches, Dwayne, Barry Oakley. Um, and then I put Butch and then later on, Greg passed away that same year. So right. I put Greg on. And then I started wood burning um, certain things in Butch Trucks, um, the bands he was in, his birthday, his passing date, his children. You know, he was freight trained, so I wood burned on his arm sleeve, you know, a freight train coming out. And then I made like four hearts where it would have been sweat come from his hair they were of his children. And I got all this thing going on, and I'm just like, it's just emotional. You know what I mean? It's just like, there's a lot going on, but now I got to title the piece. Some pieces get titled, some don't. And I tell my wife, I go, Connie, I says, it needs a title. She goes, why does it need a title? It's beautiful. And I go, it needs a title. So here it is. We got one month before we get ready to go down to Georgia. 
And if you go to Rose Hill Cemetery where the train tracks are and where a lot of the Allen Brothers songs, a lot of development came there, I incorporated train tracks above. And in the space of the truck, the tracks, I'm thinking that would be the name, but I, it hasn't come to me. Well, getting back to your question, Scott, I'm listening to a live um, government mule song and Warren singing from Dave Mason's As Sad As Deep As You. Mm. So I hear the song and just hearing Warren, it's real slow. It's just really, really powerful. And it just clicks in my head. And I'm like, that's the title. It's got everything that's going on in this piece, yeah. you know, because of the tragic incident. Um, me, me experiencing with um, a suicide loss early as a child from my grandfather. So I'm listening to the words. So now I look at it and I'm like, I got the title, but it's got to fit in between the railroad tracks. <laughs> right? So, and, and if not, this is, this is a very crucial thing because. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to work. It, 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 it spoke to me. Now I got to do it. And yeah. I'm, I'm timing it perfectly space by space and it fits. And Scott, I just was like, it's meant to be, you know what I mean? And so then I took it from the title and would burn the entire song of Dave Mason's Sad as Deep as You in there. So the lyrics? Now, the lyrics are in there wow. too. So now Gabafest comes up and Kyler, one of the members comes up to me and he goes, hey man, when we do the live auction, I want you to come in here and explain that what you just explained to the friends. And I'm like, what? You know, I'm like, I can't go up and you know talk in front of a couple hundred people right now. You know, what I'm saying I'm, I just want to have a couple beers, watch people bid on the stuff. You know, hope it raises money. Now you want me to come up and talk? You know, and and it was a, an honor because Melody Trucks band was there, and um, she saw the piece. I gave a little piece, uh, a painting to Melody, just to to help closure. You know what I mean? It doesn't. You know, it was just something I had to do. It was just did a little watercolor I gave to her. She introduced me to her family. And then I showed her the Woodburn piece of her dad that I did. So now the live auction starts off and they call me up. And now I have to explain to all these diehard Alm Brothers fans that had just tragic, you know, you know, Butch taking his life. And now yeah, was a, yeah. it was a real tough year. Mm -hmm. And now I have to get these people to understand what I created. So I explained to them, I said, I'm not going to say I'm the, the biggest Allman Brothers fan because there's people out there who could shoot you down in a heartbeat. You know what I mean? I'm saying mm -hmm. I'm a big Allman Brothers fan, but I'm not going to, I don't have all the dates and everything that's going on. Yeah. But I said, what I had to do as an artist was to try to create a closure piece for the fans that were going to approve of it. You know, I asked Sidney Smith, could I use this photo? He says, I sure. I said, I got his family members there that have to see this piece. And I have to make everybody believe. No one understands that when you do a piece of art, it's going on past you. Yeah. So, so why did I choose As Sad As Deep As You? The lyrics in that song and the way Warren sang it when we saw him live, connected to me soulfully and a lot of the lyrics that go into that song relate to the situation of being down you know having those those blues but i said to them i said i had to burn the lyrics of dave mason's song just so that whoever purchases this beautiful piece of artwork knows that, that if their child has it down the road and keeps it because their parents passes away that they know who Dave Mason is, they know who Butch Trucks is, they know what the song means, and they kind of get a feel like, what are the peaches there for? You know what I'm saying? Because they may not know that Almond Brothers genre unless you know their parents continue to teach them down the road, because that piece is going to go on past to the next generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's and that's what I'm trying to do is to keep those musicians alive, those fans alive. The photographer a lot, you know, I mean, all the, that, that here is like put all the date stuff that are significant. It's like a Wikipedia on a piece of art. Dude, that's, that's why it's art, man. When you, you look at, look at all this fucking insight you're putting into, you know, what people are looking at, 
I mean, you're breaking it down, man. You know, like I, I always used to laugh. I always get such a kick out of it was to me. It was, I only saw this as sarcastic and, and kind of weird when you would see like in an old TV show or a, or a movie or something, you'd see these people walking through like an art gallery and they're looking at these pictures and they're describing like, Oh, I see the pain and I see the depth and I see the, you know, and I'm going like, this is fucking ridiculous. These fucking people are like stoned that this is just bizarre shit. Right. I never, but you're just punching a hole through my ignorance, man, right now, because you're explaining how much depth is really in everything that you do. It's real yeah, intricate, and everything has an importance and a purpose. Oh, it, it does. Uh, the, the piece that I have of Greg Allman, I, um, Greg saw pictures of it. It's a three-foot wood-burning timeline of him. And um, I was excited because I'm a huge ZZ Top fan, and Greg Allman band was coming with ZZ Top. And August 31st, which was my grandmother, she was going to turn 98 that year. Mm. And it was a Wednesday. So being in retail, I could, it's easier to get a weekday off versus a weekend off and be, you know, being a manager. So, and I'm sitting there, ZZ Top, I, I, maybe I get a chance to meet Billy Gibbons. I says, well, Greg Allman, you know, I want to give him this piece. So I saw that Dan Rather interview with, uh, I think he did it like, couple months uh, prior. So it's done in his home. And knowing about the whole history of the Alm brothers and, and the trials and tragedies that have taken place and, yep. and everything that's going on, I'm sitting there. I'm like, I got to do this crazy piece of Greg. And it's going to have all this kind of stuff. But then I said, I got to take this, uh, make it a peace sign. And then I took in uh, the the Griffin shirt or, or some call it the Peacock shirt of Dwayne. And I use those colors around the, uh, the peace sign because Greg wore that shirt. That was the shirt. I believe, uh, Eric Clapton gave Dwayne Allman, you know, so, you know, that shirt had significance. Then I had to put photographers that are famous, all the albums that Greg did. And Shannon was showing pictures to Greg. Well, here I am like really into this piece all of a sudden I found out that Greg canceled a couple shows and he was still on to show up in August, but it was questionable. And then I think he did a couple shows, but then he went back to being, uh, then yeah. he canceled everything. So here I am going down to Gabba Fest and I saw that interview with Dan Rather. So I go to Kurt West, we, we talk on the side and he goes, Hey, I saw some of those pictures of, of the Greg Alden piece you're doing, it's really good. And I go, I says, I got the name of the piece, um, Kurt, and I'm going to give it to you, Kurt. Cause my wife knew I already named it, but I says, I wanted to see what he thought because he knew Greg very well. Yeah. So I called it. I said, after seeing that Dan Rather piece on him, I said, I'm going to call it inner peace because what I felt not meeting Greg Allman was he was in, a peaceful yeah. place, yep. you know, he, 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 he was beyond, you know, I, I think he's, he's beyond the alcohol, the drug addiction, all that other stuff yep. where the music aspect was. It's just like he would, you know, he was, he, he obviously got married to, you know, Shannon and it just seemed that he was, that's what I was getting from that interview that yeah. he was willing to accept anything that was going on. And you know what? He was, he seemed happy after, yeah. you know, and if you look at all the stuff that's going on, yeah, he brought some stuff out to him, just like we all bring stuff out to each other. But if you look at all the tragedy, how it started off and how this band just kept pushing, you know what I mean? And just kept going on. And it, and it, and to me, they're very successful at what they did, but the main message is they're no different than you and me. We just got to keep pushing. We're, we're going to have tough lives. You know what I mean? And, and, and when you come to that understanding that the fact is, I don't have to keep up with the Joneses. I'm going to try to raise my kids the best that I could possibly do. And I'm going to enjoy that because why? They're going to get older and they're going to move on. And me as a painter or something, I try to inspire people to say, because you know what? That's our job. We're going to, we're going to have our alcohol addiction. We're going to have all this stuff that's going to go on in our lives. Because why? We're human. 
we all have things that break us down individually. You know what I mean? The, one of the most amazing things and what a gift it was, was an unfortunate, you know, passing of, of Greg, but he went out, man, so gracefully, man. He went out with class. And and you know what? He, there was a lot of trouble stuff throughout his career and his life and everything. And he was tortured in, in certain ways and, and it played out in public, a lot of it. To go out with so much reverence and so much grace was just such, I mean, I, I get choked up even because it was just, it was fitting because we we kind of understood him now. You know what I mean? It was almost like, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? That's, well, sometimes I feel that um, there's an approval that I get when I finish a painting. And the little signs could be a song could come out. You know what I mean? And, and it could be of that particular artist. And not to say that some of the music I listen won't be on the radio station, or should I say, or, or on my podcast or so. But sometimes I get that and it's an approval thing. But one thing that I got to say is um, when they did that last album, Southern Blood, uh, I think, I believe that's the name of the, yeah, yeah. the album we're talking about. Yeah. And when I heard Out of Left Field, yeah, and I felt bad when I was showing the progress of this piece because I knew that Greg, something was not going on with Greg. He canceled shows and stuff, yeah. and then all of a sudden he got married to Shannon. So I kind of felt that he's foreseeing things that are coming, you know what I mean? And nobody knew and, and nobody was digging information. I wasn't calling up anybody and saying, hey, you know anything? I felt it. So I apologized to Shannon in a message because I'm showing pictures of what processes that relate to me that I think should be a part of this timeline tribute of Greg, where she's sitting there and his family's sitting there, friends that are close to Greg, where he's sick. He's, you know what I mean? He's, he may be close to the end of his line and I'm flashing pictures of what I'm doing or what may be incorporated. That's almost like if we go to a, I guess you could say like a funeral procession, you know what I mean? When yeah. you see pictures. Of, so I kind of, I felt bad about it. And she says, no, you got to keep doing what you're doing. And I said, I heard the song out of left field. I said, that's got to be about you. And she elaborated on that. So when you're listening to that entire album, and to know that we came back and, and, and she says, you're an artist, you have to do what you have to do. But she did show pieces of Greg, you know what I mean? And, and to me, that's, yeah. that's really, really cool. And I got that piece and it's, it's going to go to her whenever we meet up. I told her, so she could have that. Piece. Good for you, man. You know, Good just you. because, because if people could look at it and say, well, he was married so many times, whatever, you know what, who's with you when, Dude, yeah, somebody. like, yeah. <laughs> listen. You if you want, if you want to critique somebody, he lived his life in the public eye. There's certainly enough there if you want to be like that, you know. But God damn it, man, the guy, the guy gave us so much, so much, man. And I, I don't know. I, I just I, listen. I'll just say for me, I choose to to appreciate so much that I got to see because I often look through that lens of the way his per personally his music affected me deeply like it, oh, yeah. it it made a real profound impact as a listener i'm like you i'm not a musician i'm a listener and i i've had so many experiences at his shows and listening to his songs get through take help me get through so much just oh, yeah, from absolutely. perspective alone oh yeah absolutely i mean you, that that's that resonates with the blues and stuff you know what i mean there's some so, songs but he lived the blues see like you know i don't live the blues yeah, you know what he, I mean? It's almost got, like he took one for all of us. Well, I, I mean, you look at it and say, your father's murdered. For I, just help it, dude, somebody. yes. Then, you know, I mean. How about then, that motherfucker kept writing them letters? Yeah, I mean. You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you could, I mean, this stuff goes really deep with him, man, you know. And I, I just God bless him, man. You know what I mean? He just, he gave, yeah, he, well, gave he gave, he gave, he gave, he gave. And, you I know. Guess. And that's like, like me and Connie will say a lot of times when we meet people, yes, they're in that famous genre. They're in that, that pedestal, but they're just as human as you and I, you know what I'm saying? And I know it's got to, you know, I think it means a lot to certain people when you come up to a musician and say, maybe it's only a couple words you could say, but man, I love this song. It really got me through this dark period. You oh, know? dude. I mean, oh my God. Yeah. Music heals 
for me, uh, to me, what I see what music heals is, is the fact that you don't have to understand the lyrics. You don't have to understand the language. You just have to understand the feeling. And the feeling of music just deeply penetrates down where it's it's the ultimate communication force. You know what I mean? It, it's 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 worldwide. You know, like you just the aspect of what music does is it's on it's 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 based to me it's 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 unexplainable. What does music do to your heart? Um, illuminates it. What does music do to your soul? Music cleanses my soul. What does music do to your spirit? It elevates it. This is so much time now between the last time Dickie Betts played with the Allman Brothers and and now. Um, but where does where does he come into the game for you? Like as far as his contribution is as a musician and all he's brought to that band, which by the way, he wrote so many songs for. Oh, yeah. Well, to, to me, Dickie Betts is a huge driving force for the Allman Brothers. Yeah. I think, um, you know, uh, there's a saying between Dwayne and Dickie. People refer to Dwayne as the lead guitarist. No, we yeah. have two guitars there. Yeah. And I think Dickie could have been the commandant of the Marine Corps. I mean, this guy is just, if he was intrigued with something, he was going to push it to the limit. You know what I mean? Whether it was martial arts, playing the guitar, you know what I mean? Just whatever that he did, hunting, you know what I mean? And to see where Dickie Betts, like how Blue Sky developed. And when you're sitting in, at the Big House Museum and when the bells ring across the street and Kurt West or John Charles Griffin said, that's the bells that yeah, rang. Man. You know what I mean? And when you, when you know that, you, you sit there and say, I would love to meet him. I would like to come up and talk to him. Me and Connie were just talking the other day about Dickie Betts. He says, well, what would you ask him? I would say, what are you painting now? Because I see that he's painting. You know, something that's totally different that might catch him off guard, the fact that it's going to be a music question. I want to take interest in what he's doing now. You know what I mean? It seems like he's... The yeah, man. Marriage. Yeah, I'm with you there. He's kind of like a renaissance man. I guess that's what I could I could say. How about Elizabeth Reed? Oh, that is such a complex, beautiful piece of music, man. You know, when people say, are you going to paint your masterpiece or, or the band song, you know, when I paint my masterpiece. When I paint my yeah, yeah. It's never, you know, there's never going to be that masterpiece. You know what I mean? Like Elizabeth Reed, that's a masterpiece. That is so fucking pure, yeah. man. You know, and, and like you just, say, Blue Sky too. Like these are a lot of they're his contributions that there's so much depth. There's so much resonance and there's so much power and beauty. I mean, it could, you, I could go on and on because it, again, it touched me. You know, somebody yeah. asked me if there was a Mount Rushmore of people I could talk to an interview like the four Dickie Betts is number one to me, like right now, who's alive? Because he, t I always found him so fascinating and intriguing and talented and on, on, on these other levels. And he's a man, you know, like he's like his, whatever it is. And people can have whatever opinions they want about him. You know what I mean? Again, oh, yeah. fuck all of that, man. You know what I mean? Whatever. I think he's the same way because that's who he is. I mean, I just read a book uh, that my friend wrote uh, called The Roadie. And basically being explained about like how um that's Kim, Kim Haynes, Haynes saying, right yeah 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 Kim, yeah Kim Payne saying like well Dickie came over and asked me to do something he says and if Dickie came over and he was in a good mood he just did it because you didn't ever know what you were going to catch from him if he wasn't in a bed because I think he was I think he was obviously he's a perfectionist I mean it's like whatever he was setting out to do that's what comes across to me is he was going to do it you know what I mean and they said, like, you know, a martial arts guy, you know, now he's a musician. He can hunt. He paints. And when I met um, Dwayne Betts, <laughs> Dwayne Betts a few years back, yeah. I did a painting of Dickie. And it was Dickie in his um, his suit when he got married to Sandy Blue Sky. And he's wearing, you know, his authentic wedding gear, you know, Native American. Um, yeah. Like, a, I want to say it was like a deer skin dress. But he's jamming. And he's got the feather. So as I painted it all, I called it the Great Montanka, Montanka, if I'm pronouncing that right. And basically it was great spirit. And that's what I felt with Dickie because 
not playing as a musician, but the spirit of what was going on with the Almond Brothers. It was just like when you go to and you go to Rose Hill Cemetery, you can see that these guys fed off each other and they were going to do anything and they were open about it. You know, what I mean, I, you know, I, I think they were open about new ideas. In the late seventies too, and in early eighties, he was ripping, man. I mean, he his 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 the level of his playing was like off the charts. Like I wasn't yeah. around for the early the Dwayne stuff, you know. But these other years that I got to see were, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, I, I, I see him with Great Southern and and the brothers and, and all of that. One time, this girl I, I was with at the time had taken these great pictures of him at a Great Southern show, right? So. Yeah. They were in New York, and I'm at the beach on one Sunday, and a girl who I went to high school with was bragging as she's sleeping with this guy in the Allman Brothers band, you know? She just like, spent last night with him. I'm going, really? What hotel? You know what I mean? She tells me the name hotel. I happen to work around a block from it. The next morning, I go to work. So I call the hotel, and I ask to speak to uh, Richard Betts. They put me right through. <laughs> I'm like, this is fucking great. I used to do the same thing when I was a kid for ball players, and I got to interview the biggest names in, yeah. in sports at the time. So I just figured, okay, I haven't done this in a while, but let's see if it still goes. I'm talking to him on the phone. I go That's like, awesome. yeah, he was such a gentleman. I said, listen, I have these pictures of you. My my girlfriend took them. I was wondering if you could sign one of them for her. I might get laid tonight, man, you know? And he starts <laughs> laughing so hard. He thinks this is the funniest shit, you know? So he goes, are you going to the show? I go, we just saw you, man, the other night down in Atlantic City. He goes, well, come on tonight and come over, you know, and um, meet me downstairs and, and I'll see what I can do. So I had like a stack of these pictures, like eight or nine of these pictures. He has to keep most of them, but he signed one for her, signed one for me. And he could he keep, sure, keep them. Yeah. And then he gave me, me, I was with my buddy and he gave us tickets to the show. And he got such a kick out of just thinking, uh, I, I just, you know, if you help me out here, I get laid. You know, this is a, it's a win for me, man. If you can do the right thing, you know, he got a kick out of that. But he was a total, a cool guy, he gave us tickets and it was all good, man. It was a, oh, because well, you mentioned oh. Dwayne, right? Dwayne Betts. What do you think about these guys carrying on that legacy of the Dwayne? Devin, you know, Barry. I told Connor, I says, yeah, I got tickets to the Almond Betts uh, band. I says, you got to check these guys out. And she's like, well, what are they going to be doing? Are they just going to be playing all Almond Brothers hits? And I says, no, nah. I says, they're going to be doing some crazy stuff, but they're going to throw it in there. So we we get to the show. And um, I, I actually brought that Greg Almond piece because I wanted Devin to see it. So, you know, and Dwayne Betts already signed it. He's seen it a, a couple months prior. But, uh, but seeing these guys, just just to give them a, a a great plug is they're doing their own stuff. They are really you know good, I mean? right? And, and, and they're bringing all different kinds of influence of music yep. from different genres. Like when, like I talk, talked to you earlier, I said, you know, Herb Devin starts doing an acoustic and it's Robert Smith of The Cure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And oh, right yeah. Back, yeah. It, it just, my, my, my wife was just like, bam, she was locked into it. So and then and then the bonus is, then they're playing. Their parents, Blue sky. <laughs> you know what I mean. So it's like yeah. So yeah, you know, I look at it this way. When I look at these guys, it would be like say if I had uh, Van Gogh as a father, you know, or uh, Derek Jeter as you know as your as your father figure, Michael Jordan, whatever. It's like how much pressure as a son or a daughter. Is to to be in those footsteps. Yeah, good, and, yeah. And you know, and and you know, you, you already got the peer pressure of someone saying, "Oh, they got the voice. They're going to be good. They're going to be, you know, they expect you to be just as good as their parent." In some cases, they're just as good, if not better. You know what I mean? Or some don't even go into that realm because yeah, they're they're a different person, which which yep. we have to be too. But I I gotta imagine it's got to be tough. You know what I mean? Because when First, people see that name in headlights, Almond Betts band. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, ABB. Oh, it's going to be the Almond Brothers. It's going to yep. be this. And when you get the slice, what they're doing as individual musicians, and then you get the taste, it's beautiful. You know, you know what's cool about them too? They're all so gifted at what they do. They're they're really talented in their own right. So their influences vary between, I should say, beyond what just their dads did. Right, which is great, but they're really talented and true to who they are as individuals, oh, yeah. and they got that same vibe about them when they play. There's a tightness and a family 
type of thing that 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 comes with their their gigs, you know. Oh yeah, well when, when we saw Devin, and I saw him at, when he came out after after we saw Dwayne Betts and he was phenomenal. Then we see Devin come out here, and I'm saying, okay, I know he's done a couple things, you know, with different bands and stuff. Let's see, and he just starts jamming on the. Oh, guitar. he can play, I'm man. Like, oh, yeah. Holy shit! I said. Yeah. He, says, he looks like his uncle Dwayne. You know what I'm saying? He's got yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he's, he's got a unique, different voice than his father Greg. Right, right. But, says, but now he just comes out in full energy, and you, you know, it's just like, what the hell? And and playing to the crowd. You know what I mean? He wasn't just like one air. He was just. I, I, I happen to see him a few times his solo shows too. He he's a performer, man. He's really good, and so is Dwayne. Like in their own oh, yeah. ways, they stand. They can literally stand on their own without. Without any loss of anything, I mean, each one of them to their own is is a great musician, right? When they come together, they 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 meld, like you know, they they each it, it's just a nice blending of their talents for for yeah. you know for the cause of what they're doing. It's I love what they're doing. Yeah, and I think it's perfect for the fans because you're starting to close doors on bands that have been around for generations. I mean, you still have your, your, your albums and your CDs where you can c c continue to listen to them. Right. But as, as our doors of, as we get older, should I say, and doors start closing between uh, musicians passing away, actors, actresses, family, friends pass away. We try to want to, uh, capture some of that magic again because we're getting older and yeah. now you get right these guys who are have a lot you know a lot on their plate because they're going to be compared to their parents and they give you a whole new thing like my buddy says they give you the garnish be the garnish and that's and that's what live music i think is is it's like you have what's going on but then there's just that garnish of something special and now when these guys stepped into that new age of jam music should i say living on their parents' traditions, or should I say their legend, legendary status, now they come out there and they just hit you. It's like, boom, now they're just going to steamroll. And that, and I think that's great for the, them as musicians, but I think it's just awesome for the fans because now you can bring your kid and they're like, well, this they, they like this music. It's not just the typical old music that you listen to, Dad. Now it's, yeah. it's got another vibe. You know? And you know, let's not leave out Barry either because he brings so much flavor to it too, man. This kid is I call them a kid, but they're, you know, uh, to me, they're younger. Than, they're, 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 they're another generation. And I guess I grew up listening to their fathers, but here's the great thing. There's a whole generation, their generation, that, yeah, they know about their, father, their father's music, but they resonate with them and they bring their flavor to what they're doing. And I think that's great. They're going to carry on their own way. They're going to put out their own vibe. And it's it's just great to see them do that. And not to forget the rest of their band, by the way, Johnny. The wild thing is when you're at the Big House Museum and you see Barry there, and it's just like the resemblance of him and his dad are just did, like, yeah, it's, it's, man. Just, it's striking. Yeah. You know, and, and, and to know that, you know, to me, it's got to be kind of cool if you step into the old house where your father used to hang out. Now you're playing. Yeah, that's yeah. I wouldn't know what that is, man. That's it's gotta be cool. You know, playing those, are playing those clubs that are still around and and making Georgia or some of these clubs that they do. That there's that history and it's carrying that torch and you know, God bless them. Keep going. You know what I mean? You know, Absolutely. keep doing it. Pete, I want you to. I want to close on this because, like again, yeah. we we went off on a lot of music here and stuff, but as an artist, and you, you have all these ornaments that you're doing. So basically, this is a glass disc that I purchased at um, a craft store. And um, I had been painting Christmas ornaments for many, many, many years. You know, and I started doing your regular ball Christmas ornaments. But I found these out. And uh, basically, it's, a, it's like a reverse glass painting. So you paint backwards. Some of them I paint backwards and forwards. And when you do reverse painting, you paint the image like the outline first, and then you fill in everything. So it's pretty cool because you can clean this surface because all the paint's on the. That is, see, does that done. take you? Does that take you that much longer to do that? Like, it it, it, it does because unless you were dyslexic, you'd be saving time. Well, the clown gets <laughs> fucked up. There's, there's times you get fucked up. You know? 
Usually I try not to drink a couple beers because <laughs> I start doing it. But God, um, yeah, so, so I, so I kind of came up with this idea and me and Connie, we've done doing crafting for lots of years. You know what I mean? You know, for kids and stuff, because we didn't have a lot of money back then, you know, and we, we're very personal heirloom type people. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can make something and, and it's good. So, so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I started doing these and, um, you know, I, I try to make them affordable. Usually they're around 35 bucks shipped. And there's a lot, there's a lot of time going into it, but basically what I love about Christmas ornaments and, and I'm, and I'm getting hammered right now, asked about doing them, but I, I had to put a timeline on it because I got <laughs> stuff I got to do. Yeah. Yeah. I can... The great thing, like I, I try to explain to people is why I love the Christmas ornament so much is, or, or it could just be any ornament hanging up is the fact that it's always going to go up and hang up. You know what I mean? And it gets annually. Yeah. Yeah, annually. And when we hang up our ornaments and we date them, it's depressing because of the time that's gone by and how you do it. But it's uplifting, too, you know. And so you got to take the good with the bad. So we try to jazz these up. It could be, you know, I could do Baby's First Christmas. I've done many of those, but I don't get into it. Pets, I've done, too. But the music aspect, it's because a lot of people are involved with music that are my fan base. But if they approach me with something, I'm always up for another challenge. And then what, what's great about it is after I do it, I got to go get my wife. <laughs> and she's got to pretty them up because she does the jewelry stuff. Nice. So she'll take like Schwarzowski, if I said that right, crystals. Right. And basically, if I, I don't know if they sold it sideways, but it gives it a little three-dimensional pop. Okay. And then she'll go ahead and take copper wiring attaches a bead that she coincides with she sees in the piece right. and then recycled silk ribbon. Cool. And, and it ends up being a nice little gift and it gets overwhelmed. But the cool thing Again, is like, all these little intricacies and they all have purpose and meaning to it. It's great. Yeah. And, and the, and the, and what I like, you know, some people say, Oh, could it, I display it in the sun or a light? And sometimes, uh, sometimes it shines through like stained glass. Really? You know, but, um, it's kind of like messing around with like the same thing as you can see on this pick guard. Oh my God. This is a strap pick guard. And I, I started messing around with alcohol ink to try to jazz up guitars, but this is the same thing as the Christmas gift. It's painted backwards. Wow. So now I look at it and say, say a musician has a 1972 strap, you know what I mean? And it's all, right. should I say? But maybe they want to jazz it up. They could attach something like this. And and yeah. we've made a UV, you know, just something different because I have a lot of passion for the musician. You know, so I look at it saying, how cool would it be if a musician went on stage or something like that? Yeah, that's right. What I loved about, like, say, like, when I was approached by a, a gentleman a while back, he said, could you paint my guitar? And I knew nothing about painting. I had an airbrush, but I didn't know too much. So... I said, sure. So this happened to be a gentleman in uh, Yellow Nine, and it was a surprise because the band was releasing, you know, that CD I said, this, this one. Yeah. They were releasing that CD. So he wanted the band not know that I was putting that on an Ernie Ball guitar. And then on the back, he wanted, he was very proud of his um, upbringing by his grandparents. So one was a Marine and one was um, in the Navy. So he had me paint that on the back. So what was cool about it was the release of the CD, the group's doing a live show, and he breaks out the brand new guitar painting. And the band members flipped out because they didn't know that it was going on. And it just made a little bit of a special uh, a special garnish of that night, you know? It's cool. So, so it's cool. How, if somebody sees this work that you've done and is drawn to... Can they, how would they contact you? Can they commission you to do work or can they buy things oh, yeah. that you have for sale? What, yeah, how, do, yeah, how, do, how do you work? Yeah, right now, um, we've been trying to get up a website up and running, you know, but like most of everybody contacts me either through my Facebook page, which is artwork by Psychedelic Pete, um, or they can contact me through Instagram. And uh, I've had customers who contacted me by phone too. 
you know, so if they want to see my artwork, it's mostly displayed on those pages. I have an Etsy page, but I really haven't touched it. Um, we plan on going into 2021, trying to get a site up for the Psychedelic Casa and trying to, 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 to make things a little bit more tangible. Um, but like I tried to stress to clients, um, uh, when you when you sell art, um, I tell them shoot me what you're looking for somewhat, but remember this is your piece. I'm putting you into this piece. So they may give me a certain thing about a musician that they're inquire about a family member, but then I might find out that oh wow they were in the navy. I might hide a little thing that they were in the navy. In the, yeah yeah right you know, oh yeah. Or touch just to give it special because I try to yeah. say I I don't mind doing prints I don't mind doing a series of things but the main thing is one of a kind art because yeah. why yeah it's it's for you so right. but they can reach me through my Facebook page and what's your Instagram it's it's psychedelic Pete and our um, our two web pages that we have um, or I should say another page is the psychedelic casa that's on Facebook and Instagram. Which I share Connie's work and my work. We do it all. And the right. reason we call it the Psychedelic Casa, it's art for your home. Pete, listen, man, I can't thank you enough, man. I, I like I say, I love what you do, man. And the way you do it and how you do it and what's behind what you do, I mean, I just think what you do is just fantastic. And I wish there were more people out there that well, I can't say with your talent because that's not easy to come by, but just with your spirit, man, would be world would be a better yeah. place, man. Hey, I love being here. You know, I, I'm on the roof with you, Scott. You know, awesome time, man. And I uh, appreciate it. And you know what? I'm going to keep doing what I do. You know, I just, you know, we're going to get through this pandemic. We're going to get through the, the new adjustments to live music and social gathering again. But we're going to we're going to do this all together. We got to get back. You know, people just got to be good to people again. You know? Yeah. I'm and with cherish you. every moment you have. Well, good, brother. All right. Namaste, my friend. All right. Thank you, sir.